Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Michael Morris. I'm the Transportation Director here at the Council of Governments, and you will meet your staff, uh, which you probably already have met, but you'll meet your uh, staff that uh, basically uh, meet all of the federal requirements associated with you, the Metropolitan Planning Organization. So Chair Daniel may be joining us uh, in the beginning of our meeting. She's going to catch as much as we possibly can. We are live streaming the meeting, so there, this is going not only to you as RTC members, uh, this is uh, reaching out to anyone and the public who's interested in this particular subject. During the uh, orientation, you will see our staff uh, that are videoing uh, the meeting as well. We're eventually going to turn this live stream into a video presentation um, where we'll sync uh, the presentation to the slides and then any new members to the Regional Transportation Council or any existing members will probably send you a video uh, representation of this orientation session um, because this will be used for lots of opportunities. Uh, we have a, a relatively short presentation. Uh, it takes us some time to get through it. We've eliminated about 100 PowerPoint slides over the last two days. Uh, to really get down to what I think you as RTC members um, would have an interest in uh, today. So we will go through our presentation and then we're going to open it up for discussion, comments, questions, concerns. Um, we will have a follow-up meeting. So after the um, presentation is put together for the video, we're going to send the video out to all RTC members and then simply have an open discussion again with regard to this topic after you've had some time to think about what you're hearing today. So if you don't get your questions in today, that's not a problem. We're going to have another session uh, for RTC members to, to uh, ask questions, uh, debate, um, follow up, highlight um, whenever the video is uh, completed. I've asked April to send you um, a copy of the agenda. So if you look at your inbox, uh, you have a, an agenda for today. You don't necessarily need it to follow along, but the bold names on the agenda are our presenters. Um, and we have other uh, critical team members that are listed there for you. Because one of my goals is to have you as RTC members know us directly so you can communicate to the expert, the subject expert, uh, to help you with what you, you wish to do. Um, we believe in public service. You're our policy body. So whatever we can do to make your job easier, uh, that is what we're trying to highlight uh, in our orientation uh, meeting today. So let us go ahead and uh, uh, begin with the orientation. Uh, we do have some turnover in, in Regional Transportation Council members, so I think it's a very timely um, effort. If we go to the first slide, we purposely put this presentation together in a, in a very different form. <clears throat> You'll learn in, as, a, as an RTC member that there's dozens of federal responsibilities. Mo most of the folks you're going to hear from are paid in federal funds. And most of the authority you have is, in, is given to you by Congress as a metropolitan planning organization. Um, but instead of presenting it by individual silos or islands, we wanted to present it to you in a way that we're actually walking you through uh, how you would actually get a project, a program, or a policy implemented. So I'm going to begin with the policy foundation then you have to do a, a good job in planning uh, whatever you wish to, to do with regard to that. You then establish a, you know, a policy or a project or a program of some kind. And then there's a lot of accounting uh, and follow-up that goes into that particular project because there's lots of rules with regard to how bills have to be paid and so on and so forth. That's the four-step process we'll present today. So we're presenting this as four, four teams. 
the foundation team, the planning team, the project delivery team, and the people that get it, keep us out of trouble team. Um, that's how I think it's best for you to perceive, perceive what it is we do. It's kind of a fun way for us to present it because we don't really look at ourselves in the same light because of all the detail we have to keep track of and what it is we're doing. And then, of course, we'll open up for dialogue questions or observations. So I have the policy foundation piece on the next slide. Uh, this pol policy foundation uh, piece is bookend um, by the work of uh, Arash uh, on the technical side and Amanda on the public involvement side. So I'll, you're seeing a foundational piece of what is the RTC, the analytical foundation that drives our benefit cost calculations and our terrific public outreach effort to get as much uh, uh, input into the process before we take it to you for approval. So we have federal rules and regulations. I'm going to talk about your committee structure, this grassroots uh, support on one bookend, and then the technical, the technical foundation uh, on the others. And remember, when you come as an RTC member, you're, represent, you're representing our congressional intent. And I'll go over what Congress's intent is with regard to what you do. With regard to the boundary, uh, technically, we as council of government employees have two jobs. We provide technical assistance to 16 counties as part of the council of governments under state rule. And then uh, we have this more urbanized area under federal rule. This is the area anticipated to be urbanized by 2045. And you have this 12 county more urban area. I would say 95% of the time we are working in the 12 county uh, area with our federal hat on working for you uh, regarding the Regional Transportation Council. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on the bylaws, which is on the next slide. You, you are, <clears throat> in your political science days, you're a uni Carmel uh, organization. So you're not like Congress with a House and a Senate. You sit as one body. But to some extent, the cities that sit around the Regional Transportation Council are like House members. Each, each representative on the Regional Transportation Council accounts for approximately 240,000 persons. So it's a one person, one vote system. I think that was installed 35 years ago and it is a major uh, element, a successful element, where other MPOs across the country come to us to study this one person, one vote uh, model. So as a result, the city of Dallas has six seats, city of Fort Worth has three seats, the uh, city of Arlington has two seats. And then the really cool thing done probably 20 years ago is the aggregation of local governments, smaller local governments, adding up cluster seats into seats of, <coughs> excuse me, into seats of 240,000 to make sure large cities and small cities are represented. The counties are like our Senate. It's not exactly weighted um, as scientifically. Dallas County has two votes. Tarrant County has two votes. Denton and Collin have one. And the smaller counties uh, have to share votes. The largest criticism we get is from the smaller counties uh, that have to share a vote with a neighboring county, and they don't have a standalone vote. But sitting at 44, the RTC has always been nervous about getting too large, and that's the rub, um, the most significant rub in the bylaws. But I think it's working out well as those county judges try to alternate representation over their terms. In federal rule, there are a lot of voting versus uh, non-voting rep representation. Uh, the Congress has moved to more and more voting over the decades voting rights, especially for transit agencies. We have always had voting rights for all of our transportation agencies. So to, to make sure you, you know we're not doing anything to harm TxDOT or harm a transit agency or a toll road authority or DFW airport, you have their policy members sitting on the Regional Transportation Council 
The one and only exception to that is the district engineers are sitting on the Regional Transportation Council. So those are the only staff persons on the RTC. All others are either elected officials or they are representatives of policy bodies with the one exception the Regional Transportation Council grants to the City of Dallas because of the difficulty in getting six elected officials. They have two, uh, the ability of locating two or, or recommending two citizen representatives of which the mayor has done so in this particular case. The other wonderful thing we've done is we keep an Eastern and Western funding split. You'll hear more about that from Christie's team. We have a very strong technical committee structure. We as a staff go to that technical committee before we bring information to you. Have it be the Surface Transportation Technical Committee or other special committees. And then we have regular bylaw updates with the new census data, for example, uh, we will be reviewing uh, the bylaws and any other issues you as RTC members have. Here is the uh, strength of the Regional Transportation Council and the difference with our executive board. So the Regional Transportation Council has final transportation policy decision making uh, within our region. So once you, you as an RTC make a decision, doesn't matter what it is about, that then goes to the Texas Transportation Commission for affirmation. The, the commission has to endorse your item, whatever it is. Uh, just like the commission, if they wish to do something in our region, you would have to endorse their, their item, whatever it is. TxDOT cannot build a project in the Dallas-Fort Worth region without your consensus, and you can't do it, do it either. And this has been the, I think, one of the major elements Congress has established to make sure you as local elected officials have a voice in the transportation outcomes in your community and has been so since the, the early 70s uh, with regard to this balance Congress is seeking between the, those in local government and those in state government. So you have final transportation action. You're all about effectiveness. We spend a lot of time on equity in this MPO uh, for lots of reasons, as you'll see in the presentations, and we were very aggressive in funding outcomes in either projects, programs, policies, or whatever else you, you ask us to do. Now, from time to time, when you approve, say, a freeway, those funds are allocated to the TxDOT, or you approve a major transit investment that goes to DART or Trinity Metro or Denton, those funds would go to that organization or to a city. Sometimes you're, you're telling us that maybe the council of governments is the best agent to implement that. And the best example I can give you is Natalie's uh, region-wide traffic signal program. Because we implement it by corridor, you don't want to implement it city by city and do thousands of agreements when you can do a single agreement and implement a regional program. So the ex executive board is focused on the efficiency of what it is we do. They, they are our fiduciary agent um, with regard to what it is we're, we're doing. And sometimes I think we should spell it correctly when we, we use it on a, a PowerPoint slide. And then uh, the executive board is always interested in comprehensive policy development. What I mean by that is, you know, there's an aging program in the council of governments. They're, they work on transit for elderly persons. Well how do we work on public transit systems to integrate and not have redundant transit systems serving our elderly? So those are the type of things that we, we cross silos on within the council of government's structure, and that would be under the executive board. Now, if something comes back and says, hey, RTC, executive board says, hey, we'd like you to do something better with aging, that'll come back to you, and we'll lay, lay, lay that strategy out uh, for future uh, decision making on your part. It's important for you to see the deliverables that we uh, were doing. The next slide highlights that. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because you'll have, you'll hear others do this. But <clears throat> as you can imagine, in a federal process, the federal government doesn't give you a lot of money to do stuff without holding you accountable with regard to products. So. Uh, the RTC bylaws are 
a firm foundation of making sure we're echoing the federal process. Amanda Wilson is a very gifted public outreach person. So under federal rule, those procedures are documented and have to go through lengthy review procedures uh, if they, they wish to be amended. Uh, we're going to talk about technical software uh, that is used to drive benefit cost ratios and other calculations. I'll do that next. The Council of Governments has a strategic plan, so at 300,000 feet off the ground, what is the agency trying to do and what are those half dozen elements we're trying to do in transportation? You obviously need a, a, mo a mobility plan, so when you go into Section B, remember Team B is planning. That's all included in the, the transportation plan that you'll hear from that team. Air quality is critical. Funding the projects is critical in an aggressive position on congestion management. These are all requirements in the federal process that you'll hear from Team C uh, today. And then, of course, as an RTC member, I hope you're focused on, well, how do we minimize risk and how do we follow all the accounting procedures and what are the things you want us to do? They're reflected in our risk management procedures in the Unified Planning Work Program. So I don't want to spend any on time, any more time on those because you'll hear from those teams as they represent this. The other half of our foundation in, in our group is on the technical side. So sometimes RTC members say, hey, I'd like to do X. Is that a good idea? We, we look into the analytics of it and we say, yes, that's a great idea or no, it's not a, bad, it's not a good idea because it's not anticipated to get any users or it won't have a positive benefit cost ratio. On the other hand, uh, you'll see in the presentations from the groups very analytical procedures in the selection process of what we do. Those, those variables and inputs often come from simulation of the future of this region. So remember that in this region we grow at a million people every eight years. So it's critical we understand how people are going to behave in the future and here's a simple representation of it. We get lots of observed data and go through data analytics and replicate the base conditions of how people behave. Uh, you, you, you understand those base conditions. You, you now go get other independent data. So you have two sources of independent data. And then you replicate that travel within a software system. So we have a major software system probably the most sophisticated in the country. But there's other software systems that are used that follow a similar structure where you now, someone says, well, this is the ridership by rail station. And now we have a technical tool that mimics the ridership by rail station. And it has its own uh, procedures to make sure we're responding to the volume on a toll road, the volume on a ramp, uh, the volume at, uh, at uh, associated with a transit bus route or a station. You then, under federal rules, forecast this behavior over time. So if we add 3 million people and 2 million jobs, or we add a new link or a new rail line or a new toll road or change the toll road or the fuel price changes, we then forecast what that uh, behavior is over time. And we do so both on the air quality side and we do that on the transportation side. And as a result, um, we're, we're reducing risks. So we'll talk about, you know, scenario planning and other things. These, this aids in our uh, path forward in making decisions. Uh, and then if there's, you know, unintended consequences or policy impacts, we often can see them as a result of our simulations long before they occur uh, in the real world. Uh, and have it be safety or other types of impacts are then presented to you and then countermeasures are developed. But I don't have a lot of time this morning to, to talk about all the analytics or how great the public involvement procedure is, uh, but that is a major foundation of your success at the RTC. Here is one simple data source. It's available nationwide. Uh, we wrote this piece of software to show this image. This software is now made available to all states and MPOs across the country. Uh, you're looking at one particular location. So if you look at that arrow, this is southbound Stemmons. 
Um, this is back, I think, in April of 2021. It represents a, month, a month's worth of data. So the information is collected 24 hours a day for a whole month. Each column on here is a 15 minute period starting at midnight. And then each row is a day in the month. So look at how a lot of this uh, information looks similar day to day. Green is higher speeds, red just like a weather map is more trouble or slower speeds. So southbound stemmons in the morning actually has good level of service. Uh, but in the afternoon, people returning from all the job jobs in the Stemmons quarter heading back south, lots of congestion in the afternoon uh, peak period. We actually are using this now as partnering with TxDOT. TxDOT's leading our office and looking at improvements to the Stemmons quarter. And notice during midday, it's not all that uh, precise every day. So as you transition, you get incidents and accidents and other things that occur. And sometimes, you know, a Natalie's team will be bringing freeway management procedures and mobility assistance patrols to aid in this. And other times you'll see a Dan Lamers bring regular capacity improvement and other, other necessary elements to this particular quarter. So it's just an example, I think a visual, uh, but a good example to help you. Here is the brilliance of the public involvement team. Uh, under federal rule, uh, you must have a public participation plan that is uh, listed there for you. Um, Amanda's team is very aggressive with regard to their public outreach. We probably have 10,000 people that are, we're in regular contact with. Uh, the new public involvement plan reaches out to others that are involved in public involvement, have it be chambers or homeowners associations and other ethnic groups to um, uh, double our efforts to not have to get to everyone on our own. We'll continue to try, uh, but aggressively use other groups to help get to the same customers. You'll see us aggressively in Amanda's team respond to media. Uh, we'll respond to media within 30 minutes if, if needed. Um, our ability to communicate to the media if requested is one of the best ways we can get to our to our audience. So it's critical for us to be able to do that. I have you in my item for about 20 minutes, which is what I've taken. So if you go to my last slide, uh, this is our contact information. If you need anything, please call me. Uh, the best way to get me is my landline phone, which is there, because during the day I'm usually giving presentations and my cell phone isn't operating. Angela is my boss. She tells me where to go every day. So if you need my assistance, you're welcome to call Angela or me in trying to schedule something to help you. Amanda Wilson is our manager of our public involvement process. You're welcome to call her directly with regard to that. And Arash is our uh, main uh, travel model developer and, and data uh, person used in, in simulations. Um, he authors our most sophisticated travel model system in the United States. He, we have a very gifted team in doing that. So here is our bookend of public involvement, technical assistance with a strong federal support that drives you as a regional transportation council. So I will now move it over to, to Team B, and uh, Dan Lamers will lead us in the team, the team B presentation on transportation planning. Thank you, Michael. Uh, moving on to Team B, uh, transportation planning. Uh, Michael mentioned uh, one of the um, most critical items you have as the Metropolitan Planning Organization uh, is the development of the long-range transportation plan. And nowhere in the process uh, is your voice heard louder than in your approval of this Metropolitan Transportation Plan. Um, the COG is responsible uh, with you approving that plan. Uh, it has to be uh, approved at least every four years. Uh, it covers a period of at least 20 uh, years. Um, the, it, it contains the blueprint for uh, where, you, where your vision is for the long range 
uh, and it contains a series of policies, programs, and projects that you want to move ahead with. Uh, and Michael also mentioned that one of the most important things that it does uh, is it guides the expenditure of federal and state funds. Um, you are currently expected to readopt the transportation plan uh, in June of next year. Uh, in the time that you're not uh, approving the plan, uh, this whole team goes through the process of monitoring all of the projects, programs, and policies contained within that transportation plan uh, to ensure their expeditious implementation. Uh, the plan is multimodal. Uh, you'll see all of the modes uh, and, and types of activities that are contained within the plan. Uh, you, by your policy, you first take care of the existing uh, transportation system that's out there today, trying to get the most efficient use out of it. Uh, only when you've uh, gotten the most efficient use out of our existing transportation system uh, do you really instruct staff to look at additional uh, major capital improvements, whether it be on the rail side or on the roadway side. Uh, and in the development of all those projects, uh, you're always uh, instructing us to be aware of environmental justice impacts, air quality impacts, uh, of course, financial constraint, which is one of your biggest responsibilities, and incorporating technology uh, into the process as well to take advantage of new and cutting edge uh, technologies. Uh, and all of that, Michael went over public involvement, and again, that's a big part of how your plan is developed. Uh, one of the other planning activities Going on to the next slide, one of the other planning activities that uh, we have uh, is working directly with uh, the private sector, uh, combining that with activities on the public sector to, to coordinate uh, freight and goods movement. As one of the largest metropolitan areas in the country and the largest one uh, without direct access to a seaport, uh, your ground transportation system uh, is relied on heavily uh, for goods movement and freight freight activities. So uh, there's a team of people who work on delivering planning activities, uh, combining that uh, with, with the uh, support for a regional freight advisory committee, which is one of your advisory committees uh, that serves you. Uh, one of the new and exciting uh, projects that, that we're working on uh, is delivering what we call an air traffic control system, but on the railroad side. So the, we're blessed to have one of the largest uh, uh, conglomerations of private railroads uh, in the country that go right through the middle of our region. Uh, a lot of times, uh, some of those uh, movements can conflict with each other and with some of the uh, public sector rail, passenger rail. So we're bringing a uh, air traffic control type system to help uh, efficiently move all of those trains through the region. Uh, and then we work very closely with you and your staffs on the rail to roadway interfaces on the grade separations, uh, looking to try to make uh, that more efficient for the freight company and eliminate delays on the roadway system. This is where Shannon Stevenson would normally be. Uh, she's not here right now, but she manages our transit management and planning section. Uh, the transit management and planning section works really close with your staffs uh, to plan uh, public transportation systems, particularly with small transit providers. And they do a lot of corridor and sub-area studies uh, to try to find the best solutions uh, for how public transportation can, can pro play a role uh, in your citizens' quality of life. Uh, the most important part of that is, is perhaps dealing with some of the region's most uh, vulnerable citizens, those of lower incomes and individuals with uh, disabilities and older adults. Uh, they spend a lot of time coordinating uh, the activities of the smaller providers to make sure that all of those populations have the appropriate uh, transportation options, uh, whether it be to go to medical appointments, uh, or just go grocery shopping. Uh, the last three bullets on this slide are really very important to you because you are a direct recipient of federal transportation funds uh, for the region. And as part of that, you apportion about $100 million a year in urban transportation funding 
directly to the providers uh, of transportation, the small and the large uh, providers of transportation. Uh, and in order to enhance the use of those funds, uh, you also sponsor a uh, cooperative procurement where many of the transit-related vehicles uh, are procured directly through COG, and you have the option of uh, participating in that to uh, get the vehicles that you need. It relieves the administrative burden uh, and some of the risk on your part, and it ensures that the region uh, has consistent transportation services uh, within the region. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom, who will go over some technology options. Great. Thank you, Dan. I'm Tom Bavanti. I'm in charge of our uh, transportation innovation and technology program. I want to touch on three technology trends you may hear about over the next few years. The first is vehicle technologies. You may have noticed your car is doing more, so we're going to see electrification more automation, and the emergence of more vehicle types from e-scooters to 18-wheeled automated trucks. Connections, uh, the elements of the transportation system are connecting more effectively. We're breaking down silos and connecting electronically through APIs, and 5G will accelerate that trend. And in the cloud, more of our work is being done in the cloud. Uh, it helps our planning, it helps our operations, and that is where you're going to see a lot of innovation in coming years. So the program, I uh, just want to run down a few elements. We have what we call our Automated Vehicle 2.0 program that has a regional planning exercise that's going on now. We're investing in a number of projects from freight delivery bots helping break down a food desert in South Dallas to an automated vehicle truck port on I-35 in Fort Worth. We're putting together the data infrastructure for advanced transportation. Things like bringing the Waze roadway incident data stream into 911 centers so we can improve emergency response to roadway incidents. A new priority is using broadband to connect people more effectively to their life destinations, medicine, education, jobs, etc. We're using cloud and related technologies to better optimize our traffic signal system to help freight vehicles move through signalized intersections more effectively. We're building partnerships at the university and community college levels to advance research and prepare our workforce for next generation transportation. And finally, a lot of our work is engagement with industry trying to have, uh, attract industry to North Texas in the transportation field and matching private sector folks with your communities so we have really effective public-private partnerships. Policies. Um, the RTC adopted these policies with respect to automated vehicles, and they really go to technology writ large. It's important that we have leadership as a region in transportation technology. That's something we work very hard every day on. We want to make sure that all of our communities have the resources so they can effectively host and partner with private sector transportation technology developers. And we ask the private sector and hold them accountable to building, doing their share in those partnerships. And we'll make strategic investments to try to advance technologies that have some promise in improving our transportation system. So I'll close in, in shaping those policies and in recommending investments to you. We really look at five factors. Is the technology making our destinations more accessible? Education, medicine, et cetera. Is it improving safety? Is the technology providing affordable transportation options for our citizens? Are the benefits and burdens of technology equitably shared across the region? And finally, are those technology investments fiscally prudent? So with that, I will turn it over to Carla. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I'm Carla Weaver. I manage the sustainable development team and our land use planning area. And today I'm going to highlight three areas that we focus on and also a tool and resource that we think will be valuable for you and your community. First of all, we focus on your just your basic general land use and sustainable development. So for us, the RTC has supported um, four cycles of a sustainable development call for projects. And these are dollars that are 
made available to local governments to support infrastructure partnerships, um, often with mixed-use developments at the core of them, uh, planning studies, and a series of land banking projects where land is acquired for future implementation and um, is allowed to sort of develop or percolate for later uses. Um, we're very focused on economic development. We have a series of resources and tools outlining the various uh, transportation um, improvement uh, TIFs and PIDs, public improvement districts that are all throughout the region and how those are structured. So we have tools and resources available there. Um, we also focus on green infrastructure. We just recently held a um, one-day workshop that was well attended talking about new strategies, new technologies, and how that can be incorporated in the transportation system and in your development patterns within your communities. Um, we're interested in housing in neighborhoods. We have programs that support mixed-use development, transit-oriented development, and how we can bring the right mix of density and a workforce balance within our region, and also considering affordable housing in the mix as communities are growing. Um, we have a land use and transportation planning task force. We encourage communities to attend and to send staff to that. It talks about different best practices and resources throughout the region. Um, it's held quarterly and is available to anyone to participate. We've also worked with many communities on a series of planning studies. These may be corridor level, these may be neighborhood, they could be citywide, just depending on that land use transportation need within your your area. And then finally, parking management is an area that we focus on. We have a website, uh, parkingtoolboxntx.org, which provides a parking management toolbox of trade-offs within your community. If you have too much parking, if you have not enough parking, if you have parking not in the right place, um, how can we address that? We have lots of suggestions and strategies. And then finally, technical assistance, data collection. We work with communities to help with specific needs. Um, if you have those needs, please reach out to us and we'll see what we can do to assist assist. Um, our next area in the following slide focuses on community schools and transportation. So several years ago we realized that there were conflict points within the region when we have 127 school districts and one city can have six school districts in it and one school district can be in five different cities and there's nothing that asks them to speak to each other. So we've created a series of resources that are available on our website related to um, school siting and future growth of school facilities, elementary, middle school, and high school, what's the best infrastructure and the best transportation network to support those? Um, safe routes to school, how kids can walk and bike safely to school. Um, if you have a transit agency within your community, how the transit agency may help with busing and other issues. We've got guides and resources related to traffic management. Um, the RTC in 2013 passed a, a policy to support um, the coordination of school districts and local governments. We have technical resources available to host workshops if you want to get your school board together with your city council and just talk through issues of coordination, we're happy to come and do that. And then we also have tools available if uh, school siting different sites are being considered and we have tools to evaluate the trade-offs of those locations and to see which might be best for your community. And then one of our more popular areas is active transportation, which is bicycle and pedestrian planning. So we have a lot of tools and resources that we make available. These are very public, uh, very popular with the public. Um, we have a series of maps that we've created. You'll hear the term the regional VeloWeb. This is the superhighway of bike trails within the Metroplex. We have over 1,800 miles planned within our long-range transportation plan, and there's almost 500 miles that exist today that people can go out and bicycle. So we have a lot of resources available, making that um, available to the public, um, to you at your community, giveaways and information that you can provide to your constituents. Um, we also are very focused on safety when it comes to bicycle and pedestrian. We have recently completed a regional pedestrian safety plan that the RTC endorsed. We're going to be completing one for bicycles as well. We have uh, focus cities, Fort Worth and Dallas, with high fatality route rates for pedestrians. And so it's an area of interest and we've got tools and strategies on how we plan to address that. Lots of training and resources are held here at the Council of Governments. We have design courses for um, bikeway intersection design or pedestrian safety design related to Americans with Disabilities Act and ADA compliance. Um, we hope that you're sending your staff to those. We hope that you're interested in the latest technologies on how to improve in those areas within your community. If there are needs that you have related to design or implementation, please let us know. We also have safety campaigns such as our Lookout Texas campaign that focuses on roadway drivers and pedestrians and bicyclists all working together and looking out for each other that if you're interested in more information, we're happy to provide. Um, we 
<clears throat> have a, me a group that meets quarterly, the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Um, we have close to 100 in attendance. They've been virtual through Zoom currently, and we talk about bike ped safety and trails and parks planning and the on-street accommodations that are needed for bicyclists to connect. Um, so we want to make sure that all communities are engaged in that committee and getting that latest and greatest information. And then finally, I'll just mention that we have what's called the Transportation Alternative Program, where um, every two to three years, we do a call for projects for bicycle funding, uh, sidewalk funding, trails. And so be keeping an eye out for those. We want to make sure that local match is available for those. Um, but it's something that there's always much more demand than we have resources for, but it's a valuable um, uh, incentive and ability for us to help assist in some projects that you're trying to get built. Finally, a tool that uh, Michael asked me to highlight is our policy for gentrification. We put a report together to help mitigate gentrification within communities. Our next slide will show you kind of a snapshot of the report is really what is gentrification? How do we see that manifest in North Texas? What are tools and strategies that can be used to help mitigate it at the local level, at the county level, at the state level? And you'll find some great resources there. Um, the appendix is full of sort of a plug and play match depending on what your issue is. Um, if you have any questions about that, please let us know. I encourage you to check that out. And as new housing demands come within our region, this, this topic is even more and more important. And we'll continue to have conversations about it with our elected officials and with local staff at our communities. Thank you very much. I'll now turn it over. Uh, we're wrapping up section B um, and then our next section is our C team who's going to talk about some of the projects and programs of the Council of Governments. Thanks Carla. So my name is Chris Klaus, Senior Program Manager in the air quality area. Uh, this is a pretty exciting uh, segment or comprehensive project and program delivery, the product of planning. So I think this is what separates us as, a, as our MPO across all the other MPOs in the country. It's one thing to just go and plan and forecast, but then it's actually putting, putting projects into practice and putting things on the ground that actually uh, that you support, that we can come to you, we develop, we, we bring to you with, with recommendations from the cities, from uh, the communities from the businesses and we bring to you to support to actually implement to be able to meet these planning objectives and goals that we've uh, we've crafted out in some of the stuff that you had previously heard um, so me being first in air quality you know i do want to mention that we are non-attainment for the pollutant ozone there's a series of criteria pollutants that uh, we're bound to be met uh, as outlined by the federal government um, and the Environmental Protection Agency. Ozone is one that we are not in compliance with. I think as a result of our success of growth and the amount of population and, and business that we have in North Central Texas, along with climate situations, it's, it's been a challenge for us to, to stay in check with the uh, ozone standards that uh, continuously get, get more difficult as, as time progresses. Uh, for good reason to protect public health, but uh, that poses challenges to us and, and again creativity to come up with new programs or projects and policies that we can implement to try to meet those reductions. Uh, as you saw previously, we have a 16 county planning area. Uh, the urbanized area is, the t is a 12 county area and within that 12 county area is a, depending on what standard you're, you're, you're looking at, it could be a 9 or a 10 county area that fails to meet uh, non-attainment. Uh, so I've highlighted those in this slide uh, in, in yellow and then uh, also Rockwell is highlighted in pink because they remain non-attainment for a previous uh, ozone standard. So this is the area that from an air quality standpoint that we, we plan and we try to uh, implement things to try to lessen the burden and the impacts of uh, the ozone uh, uh, levels in the area. One of the main responsibilities that you have, aside from developing a mobility plan or what you'll hear from Christy uh, with regard to a transportation improvement program, is to ensure that all these projects that we're, that we're planning for actually don't negatively adverse air quality uh, in the region. So anything that we're doing on transportation has to go through an air quality assessment. And that's called transportation conformity. Uh, we're actually beginning a next conformity cycle as we speak, so you'll be hearing much more of that over the coming months. But the bottom line is uh, about three years ago, we received our last uh, air quality conformity approval by the United States Department of Transportation. That piece of paper that I'm showing on the screen now is, is worth billions of dollars. That actually allows us to implement and move forward with uh, all the federal projects that we've outlined in the mobility plan and the transportation improvement program. So as getting to the, to the crux of the 
product of planning, you know, th this slide is wanted to share with you is uh, a bunch of programs and, and projects that we've created and you've supported and uh, helped us to implement across the region to try to lessen, um, you know, emissions from the automobile, making the transportation system more efficient, more effective, making the automobile less of an impact on, you know, emissions coming out of a tailpipe to be able to uh, add to those precursor emissions that, that ultimately form ozone in a, in a late uh, summer afternoon. So, all, you know, hats off to everyone that is, uh, you know, continues to support, support this and, and we're very appreciative and grateful for the types of things that we're able to be able to do in North Central Texas to try to uh, keep ozone at a, at a bearable level but with much more to go to meet these standards. Uh, I just want to leave you with on my last slide is just to share with you for more and for I always joke if you're having a hard time falling asleep at night, you know, you can open up our some air quality material and uh, it, it's pretty exciting stuff. So uh, I wanted to share with you that we've also worked with our internal group to to convert this to Spanish and, and looking at other translations that we might be able to, to to do to be able to just keep the message out there and and uh, let, let folks know what we're doing and all the programs and projects that were implemented is all contained within this area. So um, next slide, and I think that then goes on to the next area that would be for thank Christy. You. All right, well, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Christy Gotti. I'm the Senior Program Manager for Transportation Project Programming, which loosely translates into tran transportation funding. Uh, in English. Uh, the first slide here I want to show you is really, uh, this is our 2021 through 2024 transportation improvement program. This is both our funding document for the region and it's also a funding process. So um, that's, is a, it's important, it's important to realize the process behind it as it is to understand what's actually in it. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, local governments, um, the Texas Department of Transportation, we have three districts. Um, we have uh, transit agencies, you can see the main ones listed here, Dallas Area Rapid Transit, uh, Trinity Metro, Denton County Transportation Authority, plus all of the other smaller providers. And then there are other transportation agencies such as DFW Airport, um, North Texas Tollway Authority and such, and we coordinate with all of those partners together to develop uh, this inventory of all the funded projects in our region. We go to the next slide. Uh, so what is included? Um, while at any given time, the transportation improvement program itself is only covering four years worth of funding and our current one is sitting at about 13 billion in that uh, four year period. Our total scope of all the projects that are active right now is $46 billion. So it is a lot of investment uh, that, that is going through the pipeline right now. Um, and that's a combination of all of our federal, local, and state sources. Uh, within that, we have over 1,100 active projects. Uh, 900 or so are on the roadway side. Another uh, 250 or so are on the transit side. And we're coordinating with 68 individual implementing agencies. Um, so a couple pieces of information that I put there at the bottom for you as well. The first is an explanation of the funding categories. TxDOT uses um, certain category numbers and then we use a lot of acronyms and so we explain in this particular location what all of that means and who selects which categories and so on. In addition, we have several project search engines that are available to you. Uh, those are hyperlinked there as well so that you can go in and search either by geography, you can search by project type, uh, you can search by um, um, any number of factors, year and so on and so forth uh, using those project search engines. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, so with this, I wanted to go through really what is your role in the process and what is our role in the process of um, project programming. And um, the first is selection and funding. So the RTC's role is to approve the final project recommendations. The staff role, what we provide to you is really a support to evaluate those projects and provide a recommendation uh, that we bring forth for your review and approval. Um, with regard to the TIP documents themselves, um, in that case, we develop those documents, we go out and meet with all the local agencies, we gather all the latest project details, we pull it all into one place, and then we bring it to you for your review and approval. And the same thing occurs with the quarterly um, modifications that we do to all those transportation projects as well. 
And then uh, the, the next thing that we do is really providing um, uh, project implementation assistance and project tracking assistance to make sure that all of these projects get across the goal line and hopefully in a um, timely manner. So with that, let's move on to the next slide that will go into a little bit more depth about project selection. Uh, this occurs through what you will hear, the terminology of calls for projects or funding initiatives. Um, so these generally involve either a very highly competitive project selection with a lot of technical criteria and scoring, or they can happen through partnership programs where it's really us sitting down with our partners and going through the priorities that have been identified in the plan and determining which ones are ready uh, to proceed at this point in time. Uh, timing, we used to say that our federal and state funds, uh, we, we used to get them in five to six year bill increments and we do two calls for projects or funding initiatives each bill. Uh, because that's been, become a little bit um, less systematic, I would say, in terms of timeline, we really just do project selection as the funding becomes available. This happens both on the federal state side and using your regional toll revenue funds and regional transportation council local funds as well. Uh, moving on to the next slide. One particularly important uh, funding initiative that occurs every year um, is the regional 10-year plan. So House Bill 20 was implemented uh, several years ago. We did our first approval of a new 10-year plan in 2016, but this was not new to our region. Uh, we had done a prior 10-year plan in 2004 and had been monitoring its implementation over time. House Bill 20 just really formalized that and made it a statewide um, effort. Uh, we do this in concert with the state's Unified Transportation Program, or UTP. Uh, the UTP is where the state sets their um, anticipated allocations by project funding category and they identify the specific projects in which they plan to put funding. Um, when we are doing the 10-year plan, we are really focused on only three of the funding categories uh, that are available. Uh, so those would be Category 2, uh, or Metropolitan Corridor as it's called. Uh, this is an MPO selected category. We also work on Category 4, which is a TxDOT district selected category. And then Category 12 is selected specifically by the Texas Transportation Commission. So it's really bringing all those funding sources together to fund very large um, highway projects. And you can see at that link there um, all the approvals that we have done. There are multiple maps available of what has been funded and the status of those over time. Moving on to, I think congestion management is next. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Natalie Betker. I'm the senior program manager in charge of congestion management and system operations. Uh, so Congestion management, uh, the congestion management process is one of our federally required um, processes that we have to go through as a metropolitan planning organization. And the main focus of our congestion management process is how do we get the most out of our existing transportation system by implementing trip reduction strategies or operational strategies on our facilities. Uh, this plan was currently approved by the RTC back in July of 2021 and we're getting ready to work through corridors with our partner agencies to identify strategies to implement on corridors with performance deficiencies we feel we can make improvements without adding additional capacity. Uh, really the CMP looks at adding capacity as a last resort so it's really getting after these low cost quick to implement strategies. Um, through the next slide, I'm going to highlight some of the types of strategies that fall in um, to ones that we look at as part of our congestion management process, and these are transportation system management and operational strategies. Um, we have uh, several categories here, but the first category I want to focus on is our intersection improvement and signalization program. This program we've been implementing for quite a while. Uh, Michael had mentioned it at the beginning. We're really, we're trying to get um, our signals to coordinate properly across jurisdictional lines and on major uh, arterials within our region. And so a new focus we've taken on this particular program is to look at the equipment that is out there in the field for traffic signals, coming up with a minimum standard, as well as looking at the performance of the traffic signals. So we know whether we need to implement new equipment or we just need to do signal timing and better coordinate that across our jurisdictional lines. 
Um, another area in this um, particular category is our intelligent transportation systems. Uh, really, we do a lot of the planning side and we work with pro our partner agencies to implement projects in this particular area. So through our regional ITS architecture and strategic deployment plan, we look at ways we can uh, implement projects and better integrate systems um, across these jurisdictional boundaries and between uh, major operating agencies that we have within the region, like the TxDOT districts, uh, as well as what we operate on our managed lane facilities. Uh, we also host our 511 DFW system, which is a traveler information system, but it also has a back-end operating system that allows us to share data with our partner agencies so they can see what's going on on different systems, again, to adjust signal timing, to possibly deploy additional equipment out to help uh, with stranded motorists uh, and things to that sort. Uh, we also work in the area of transportation security. In this, in this particular area, we work very closely with our emergency preparedness department where we look to identify critical transportation infrastructure and monitor that critical transportation infrastructure as part of uh, this particular effort. Uh, as we move to the next slide, I'm going to change my focus a little bit to aviation. Uh, on the aviation side, we focus on planning, education, uh, and we're getting into some implementation type things. So we really focus on our regional aviation system planning effort. This looks at our regional aviation facilities assets as well as the needs uh, within those assets as well as getting folks to and from those assets using the surface transportation access. Um, another area within this is our urban air mobility and advanced air mobility efforts. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of progress in this over the last several years where we've began to integrate our unmanned aircraft uh, systems uh, integration task force and working groups um, to try to bring folks together, start conversations about what technologies are out there as well as start talking about how do we integrate these systems to our surface transportation systems um, without conflicting with our airspaces that are out there. So it's a very complex um, area, but we are making progress. And the biggest thing is we're opening up those communication lines between those partner agencies to see how we can implement that. Uh, we also focus on the aviation education sector, um, getting folks educated to help support aviation within our region. Uh, as well as educating the public on this um, advanced air mobility initiative and trying to get them to feel comfortable with those particular efforts. Um, the next slide I'll move on to our transportation safety area. Um, in this particular area, our main focus is to monitor the performance and contributing factors of crashes that occur on our system so we can then implement projects to help reduce those crashes or possibly in our goal is to eliminate them altogether. Um, some, some of the projects that we actually implement are listed on here that the Council of Governments is responsible for, uh, including our uh, traffic incident management training program. Um, and this program has been around for several years. So it's training, but we also complement that with funding uh, equipment for first responders to use when responding to crashes out there on our roadway system. Um, and then we also have a policy that's in place that the RTC adopted that supports this coordinated effort out there for multi-agency training and incident response. Uh, there's some, a few other programs that we do implement in this area, including our mobility assistance patrol programs. We work with our TxDOT partners, our NTTA partners to provide assistance to stranded motorists on our roadways. Um, so they're not out there trying to make repairs on the side of these high-speed facilities, uh, which is a very unsafe condition. So that, those particular programs is a partnership between multiple agencies within our region um, and is, is very critical to the operation of our system. Another area that we've worked with very closely is commercial vehicle enforcement. Again, a safety component to get those commercial vehicles that are not meeting safety standards off of our facilities so they're not causing crashes or other incidents. Um, the last slide I'm going to cover is our transport or travel demand management program area. Um, and this really looks at how do we reduce the demand on our transportation system by implementing programs like carpooling or van pooling, telecommuting, riding transit, biking and walking. Um, so we do this in several ways. We have several components here. First, we like to track who is actually uh, changing their commute mode uh, from a not from a single occupant vehicle travel and we track that through our tri-parking it program 
Um, we also do implement this program through policies, which you'll see the next item on here is a regional transportation resolution that was recently uh, adopted in the, earlier this summer, um, where we're trying to sustain um, the congestion, you know, what, what impacts COVID had by reducing those trips on our facility and how do we sustain that moving forward uh, through this particular policy we were looking at a 20 percent reduction for both public and private sector employers within our region uh, and so we're working on a plan to actually track that and implement that and do outreach related to that particular policy and then the last area is really implementation of projects uh, one example on here is our park and ride facilities again getting uh, facilities available to people to carpool, vanpool, take transit within our region so we can get them out of their vehicle and help improve the congestion levels on our roadways. Um, that concludes my portion of this uh, presentation. I'll turn it over to Jeff Neal. Thank you, Natalie, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Neal. I'm the Senior Program Manager for the Streamline Project Delivery and Data Management Team here at the Council of Governments. And as the, our name implies, uh, we work our best really as an extension of all the program areas that you've heard from here today, either providing or facilitating the necessary products and services necessary so that either us uh, carrying out the RTC's transportation initiatives or in working with our external partners uh, will be able to help uh, uh, carry out and implement as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible, the projects, programs, and policies. Uh, that are important to the region. We also want to make sure that we're, through our process, ensuring as, as much as possible an equitable, comprehensive, and performance-based planning process. And so the nature, really, of our business is collaboration. You've heard us talk a great deal about uh, how a lot of our work is breaking down silos. I think we continue to do that with our work uh, more and more every, every single day. So collaboration with all of our public and agency stakeholders, whether they are resource agencies with the state and federal uh, governments or uh, among uh, our various entities out there, anybody involved with various transportation projects. We want, we want to make sure that we're communicating with them, incorporating their needs and interests, and ensuring that the project development process is successfully uh, integrating any kind of uh, needs across the natural, social, and economic, environmental uh, 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 spectrums. And above all, it means that we need to make sure that we are providing or optimizing the data necessary to make informed decisions. Uh, whether it's those that are GIS oriented or other databases, we, we obviously need to have the greatest amount of information possible so that we can make the most informed decisions. We believe that. Is, is what will contribute then to a significantly reduced implementation time, cost, and then even through this process, we're also in, uh, facilitating greater inclusiveness, uh, making sure that we understand where we have to mitigate impacts uh, as early as possible, wherever they may be, and we think that uh, also this helps to promote greater stewardship uh, among, among our various efforts. Part of that on the next slide is making sure that we are uh, carrying out the, uh, the federal government's requirements in regards to non-discrimination through environmental justice, executive orders, uh, and other uh, means to ensure that we are addressing properly, appropriately, the various effects of policies, programs, and projects, ensuring that there are not disproportionate impacts making sure that any benefits that occur are not delayed or are not themselves disproportionate. And so we, and we do uh, a great deal of technical activities and coordination to address those impacts. And then part of those is also overcoming language barriers. So we work greatly with Natalie and Amanda Wilson and the public involvement team uh, to make sure that we're communicating uh, in different languages, in different forums to all of the stakeholders involved with projects. That even includes uh, co consultation with, uh, with tribes uh, because uh, even though there may not be uh, reservations within this area, there are certainly lingering tribal interests and uh, individuals who are a part of tribal nations and through uh, permission with TxDOT and other agencies, we are allowed the ability to be able to communicate with those people directly and that allows for us to make sure that their needs and interests are properly incorporated. 
Uh, we have an environmental justice index tool as well, which is a number of one of a number of technical tools we have available to make sure that we are uh, readily calculating and uh, uh, describing uh, the impacts that we believe projects may have and trying to address them appropriately. We also work through our Title VI program uh, to make sure that uh, agencies that we are partnering with as well as ourselves are complying uh, with non-discrimination policies. Uh, through the Title VI program, that kind of outlines our, our various efforts uh, through monitoring our sub-recipients and, uh, and all of those who are receiving funding assistance, particularly those through uh, the Federal Transit Administration. This program is uh, updated triennially, and our last program was done back in 2019. On the next slide, we did want to talk a little bit about how, while a lot of our work is focused throughout the transportation planning process, more and more we're focused on monitoring system performance uh, uh, after projects have been implemented. One way that we're doing that is through asset management. Again, as part of trying to make sure that we are as efficient as possible with our, with our investments. Uh, through the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, which is the nation's current uh, surface transportation bill, uh, we are required to coordinate with Texas Department of Transportation in establishing targets for national highway system pavements and bridges. And so recently we, uh, in fact, what you see here is indicating our current stance in which we're supporting tech stats targets that have been established for the state. Uh, it is actually possible for MPOs to set their own targets, but it's through this collaborative process that uh, that we uh, we have intended at this time to continue supporting tech stats targets. And through that, we're also required to uh, collaborate and develop our own strategies here within the region because we do have uh, national highway system facilities that are not owned by the Texas Department of Transportation. What can then we do to be able to facilitate improved performance on those facilities? And whether it's through a, a recently uh, enacted uh, improvement program directed at non-NHS pavements or through a, uh, 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 an infra uh, discretionary grant program award that we had received recently to address bridges, this is part of our contribution working with TxDOT and other entities across the state to make sure that um, our facilities are, are, are seeing optimal performance both now and in the future. Part of that on the next slide is making sure that because there are certainly uh, various risks associated with investments, it's important to understand then what might be the risks that are affecting asset performance over time. A lot of that is having to do with impacts from, uh, from natural disasters and changing climate conditions. And so it's important that we integrate resiliency and life cycle planning uh, within the work that we do. And this map that you see on this slide indicates uh, the, uh, the boundaries of an area to the north and to the west of the heart of the region in which we're looking at how uh, future flooding impacts can be mitigated. We don't want, as this area will likely continue to develop as, as quickly and as intensely as the remainder of the region, for there to be downstream impacts to transportation facilities, land uses, and, and, and uh, other major investments uh, because of flooding. And so it's important that whether it's flooding, whether it's wildfires, whether it's uh, heat, drought, and, and other conditions, that we are working to identify how best to address these various stressors and events as much as possible so that as we continue to grow, uh, it won't be as costly or as timely or as impactful these events on, on the various facilities that we have built or intend to build as our region continues to grow over time. Uh, we'll end this, of course, with contact information from the folks that uh, had presented here with Group C, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Dan Kessler, our Assistant Director, to begin our discussion on Team, team D. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I'm Dan Kessler. I'm the Assistant Director in Transportation. Ken Kirkpatrick and I will wrap up this presentation today uh, covering basically the financial, legal, administrative oversight of the MPO process. Uh, as Michael said in his opening remarks, uh, this is a partnership when we get to this point of the MPO process with our COG Executive Board. They do serve as our financial fiduciary agent. So whenever we take items for 
approval to you on the program side and there's money involved, it eventually goes back to our COG executive board and they will take a parallel action uh, specifically related to the financial strategies. Uh, there is also a very important department in our agency, our administration department. Um, they serve basically as our firewall with our financial programs. Uh, transportation staff does not actually ha physically handle money. Uh, that all takes place up on the fourth floor and they're great partners with us as we administer uh, our programs. I'm going to cover for you uh, the Unified Planning Work Program. This is one of your key responsibilities as Regional Transportation Council members. It is essentially the scope of activities that your staff will carry out over a two-year period. This program is led by Vicki Alexander, Program Manager on our staff. Vicki does an outstanding job year in and year out uh, with this program. Uh, it is a program that is required by the federal government through our Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Administration regulations in order for us to receive planning dollars in the metropolitan area that uh, you oversee. Those dollars have to be uh, accounted for and demonstrated uh, through the Unified Planning Work Program. There are four key elements to this. Uh, as I said, it is our basically our, our requirement for the coordination of metropolitan transportation and air quality planning activities. You've heard about the majority of those presentations throughout this, uh, throughout this presentation. It's developed every two years. We're on a two-year cycle. Uh, but you'll see this document regularly. Um, this is a very dynamic process. There are grants coming in all the time from lots of different directions. You've heard about a lot of those this morning. And so we effectively are bringing you not only a document for approval every two years, but we will bring you quarterly amendments, much like Christy mentioned in the TIP process, you will see uh, amendments to the Unified Planning Work Program coming through. It does summarize all our planning activities, as I mentioned, uh, and it allocates those uh, projects to specific, uh, allocates those dollars to specific grants, programs, and projects. Uh, there are probably uh, 60 to 70 active grants at any one time in a unified planning work program. Uh, there can be literally 700, several hundred projects as you go through that document uh, that specific funds are allocated to. We do prepare a, a companion document to that, an annual report every year that summarizes all the activities as a requirement that's supplemental to the work program. And it's a great document for you to keep track of what your staff is doing, and any time that you need technical assistance or you need support from us, uh, this is the place we start uh, to log uh, where the activities are going to occur. Uh, about half of our FTE, FTEs, our staff capacity, is dedicated towards planning activities. I won't go through these lists. They are provided for you there. Uh, on that prior slide, we did have a link for you to go actually see where the Unified Planning Work Program is kept. It's a lengthy document. It is available on the web as well as all the amendments. But this slide lists all the planning activities, many of which you've heard about this morning uh, that, the, that the work program handles. Uh, next slide covers all the implementation families that we talked about. Again, you heard from Chris and Natalie uh, on all the air quality and congestion management activities. Oftentimes, you may have heard it hear us refer to this as management and operations. Um, but this is where uh, activities occur that largely the funding sources are not eligible uh, with planning funds. Uh, that is one requirement that we do operate under. We have formula funds that come to the region. You'll hear a lot about those funding, all those different funding sources and they're dedicated toward planning. But you will also be approving a lot of these types of programs where it may be engineering services or marketing or uh, different strategies that may not be eligible for federal planning funds. This is where we gather up all those activities. Again, I won't go through all these because you've heard about all these uh, this morning. Uh, next slide shows you an overall picture of our funding program for uh, the coming fiscal years, FY22, beginning October 1st. So right now, September 1st really starts uh, a pretty hectic process for us of the year-end closeout, and we'll spend the next probably the next 60 to 90 days closing out the FY21 programs and grants and be firing up the FY22 and 23 funding. Uh, it is an extensive program. You can see that uh, we document approximately $170 million 
of activities that will be carried out through your metropolitan planning organization. Uh, that number is dynamic. It will grow on a regular basis. Uh, one of the key things I want folks to understand, though, is that all those dollars are not spent necessarily by us. We touch those funds and we administer those funds, uh, but about half of that funding is provided to our partner agencies. Uh, good examples are when Dan Lamers talked about our transit work that we do. A lot of that transit funding that we received is directly passed on to our small transit partners. Uh, the work that Natalie talked about with traffic signals, that's a large funding grant. Uh, we're not in the traffic signal business. Those are dollars that go out to our local governments working with consultants and local governments on traffic signal programs. So there's many examples of where those uh, funds go through. But in this slide, we have showed you uh, a pie chart, uh, a source of a lot of our funding. Um, and those dollars come to us through a lot of Department of uh, Transportation grants, whether it's federal highways, federal transit, federal aviation. Uh, but you see we also receive funds from uh, Department of Energy, EPA, Department of Defense, TxDOT, and you'll see those uh, broken up in this pie chart. Um, next subject I'll cover really quickly is our fiscal management area. Uh, this is a group led by Don Dalrymple, uh, our newest senior program manager. Uh, Don has a terrific staff of folks with uh, all kinds of uh, public administration backgrounds. Um, they are basically the bridge that I described. This is what connects the $170 million that I talked about to the real world. This is how we get dollars from our funding agencies uh, down to our project managers uh, and how we basically process our dollars through the department. Um, four key programs that we talk about uh, that they're very key involved in is certainly our budget development and monitoring process. We do develop an annual budget process that's developed in concert with the agency. Again, that's an example of a budget that we develop for our department that's incorporated into an agency budget that's then adopted by our executive board. A significant amount of effort, obviously, is both the receipt uh, of payments and the processing of payments. Uh, we are uh, an agency in transportation. We have a lot of different subgrantees, a lot of different contractors and consultants, and that's how those dollars are administered. Uh, all this requires compliance. Uh, we have a great group of folks that are basically focused on grant and contract compliance in our fiscal management team. And of course, one of the big challenges whenever you're dealing with government money, and certainly in our case, uh, all of the federal funds which we receive, which the majority of our funds uh, uh, come through the federal government, uh, require a significant amount of financial reporting. One of our biggest challenges that I mentioned earlier is the fact that we do receive funds from so many different state and federal organizations. Uh, they don't all necessarily have the same structure or reporting requirements, and so keeping track of all the different requirements of all these different funding sources uh, is a pretty big challenge. Uh, but I will say that uh, I think the success of our organization uh, continues to be one, we're able to develop terrific projects, but we also have terrific uh, accountability in our funding process. Uh, when we're approached by federal agencies to administer grants, I think we can demonstrate a really strong track record uh, of administering federal funds, and I think success builds success, and I think our fiscal management activities uh, largely uh, support that. I'll now turn it over to Ken Kirkpatrick, and Ken will talk a little bit about uh, our legal services and we'll close this out. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ken Kirkpatrick. I'm the general counsel for COG. I provide overall legal uh, support and services to the agency, including the transportation department. So I did want to highlight a, a few items uh, related to risk management, contract services, and procurement that we use to implement uh, all the programs, plans, projects that you heard my colleagues uh, talk about earlier. But on this slide, I just wanted to highlight a couple things. <clears throat> You know, our, our function in the legal team is to provide advice on RTC and departmental initiatives. Uh, you have a very innovative staff all across the department, lots of different programs and projects. So our legal philosophy is how do we get to a yes to help in our part in implementing those plans and programs. And then from your perspective as the RTC, what's my statutory authority? Really, there are two sources. One is Title 23 under the United States Code, which is the highway section, and then Title 49, which is the transit section. So the RTC, when questions come up related to, is this within the scope and responsibility of the RTC is the policy body of the MPO, 
those are the statutory provisions that we would look at to make that uh, determination. So just going into risk management activities on the next slide. Um, <clears throat> really, from a risk perspective, we look at it in three different buckets. There's risk in, in projects that are implemented by staff. There's risk associated with projects that are implemented by consultants. And then the, the third category would be projects implemented through subgrants or subrecipients. That's where we have our, our highest levels of, of risk and we spend uh, more time and attention on. But really, there's three buckets of risk assessments that we do. One is on grant applications that we're going after from a competitive basis. So we analyze what do we need to do from an agency and departmental perspective to accommodate uh, those grant programs? Are we implementing, like I said, through staff, through consultants, or through subrecipients? If we do decide to subgrant those funds uh, through your direction, uh, then we go through a rigorous risk assessment process to evaluate you know, what measures and mechanisms do we need to implement to mitigate not only our risk as COG in the RTC, but risk from the perspective of our uh, partner, typically a local government, and implementing those programs. So sometimes that rhymes with we might do more on-site reviews. Sometimes it rhymes with we might do a procurement review if a local government is purchasing something through a grant activity. Uh, or in the case of uh, vehicle type purchases, COG may uh, retain the lien holder status to make, tr make sure we maintain uh, uh, satisfactory continuing control over that particular uh, asset. And then, as mentioned earlier, one of the programs that we have developed to, to well, I think, in a unique way to reduce risk not only to our partners but to COG is through our transit cooperative vehicle program, where COG would conduct a cooperative vehicle procurement. Uh, to ensure all the FTA and federal terms and conditions are complied with. Uh, so COG actually makes that purchase. We provide those vehicles to our small transit providers you know, outside the DART, outside Trinity Metro DCTA service area. But COG would maintain the lien holder on those vehicles to make sure that they're used for their um, uh, actual uh, intended purpose. Uh, from a procurement service standpoint, uh, just highlight a couple things. Uh, we have a team of people that conduct uh, probably 12 to 15 major procurements a year for transportation related purposes. Uh, that's to the tune of maybe 12 to 15 million dollars a year. So from the standpoint of um, items that support employee activities, tables, chairs, things like that, Dan referenced our COGS administration department. They carry out those procurement activities. But if it relates to a transportation consultant, vehicle or equipment related purchase. We have a team of people in transportation that actually carries out uh, those procurement activities consistent with our TxDOT and FTA approved uh, procurement uh, processes. And then uh, the last bullet here I wanted to highlight was our disadvantaged business enterprise program. Because we are a recipient of FTA and USDOT federal highway funds, we have a requirement to develop a, a DBE program. Uh, to assist our minority contracting community to have a fair share participation in our contracting activities. Our current program uh, is approved for fiscal year 20 through 22. Uh, the DBE participation goal is 19.4%. Uh, we'll be undertaking an activity in the spring of 22 to update that uh, for the next uh, uh, three years. And then just going into contract services, to highlight a couple of items. Really, there's two types of contracts that we help develop. One is money coming in. Those are typically grant agreements from funding agencies. A second element of that would be uh, when we enter into local match agreements with our member governments to support programs uh, being implemented through RTC and the Council of Governments. Second category would be uh, money going out, consultants, subrecipients, subgrants. So our team develops all those um, um, uh, contract templates and, and arrangements to ensure they, they comply with the specific uh, federal program or state program that uh, is funding those activities. <clears throat> and just to wrap up uh, my section, innovative finance, you will often see items that come to the RTC where the RTC is engaging in a, <clears throat> in a swap of federal for local funds. That would be an example where it might be uh, in the RTC's in RTC's interest to advance a, a project with federal funds. In exchange, a local entity might provide a like amount of local funds over time, where the RTC may use those funds to implement smaller projects that might not be suitable to implement uh, via federal funds because the associated 
uh, requirements and regulations with uh, the, the federal dollars. <clears throat> and then in other instances, the RTC is allocating funds uh, for sustainable development or economic development related partnerships. Sometimes RTC chooses to do that uh, as a grant when there's a high level of transportation uh, uh, activity or interest. <clears throat> and some, sometimes the RTC does that as a loan where there's a, uh, some transportation interest, but there's a more predominant economic development interest. So RTC may decide to do that <clears throat> as a grant or a loan and sometimes in combination thereof. So whenever that happens, our team is the one that helps develop the contract instrument to make sure all the RTC terms and conditions are carried out and complied with. Uh, last item to note here, one of those unique arrangements was the RTC financial backstop for State Highway 360. Uh, related to the 360 South Toll Road partnership between RTC, TxDOT, NTTA to reduce risk to TxDOT and to NTTA. The RTC um, programmed, uh, committed its programming authority to backstop uh, the loan on that project, which was $300 million. Earlier this year, NTTA was in a position to be able to uh, uh, re refinance their bonds bring 360 into the NTTA system, extingu extinguish the RTC financial backstop. Uh, so those are items that we work uh, very closely from a legal standpoint to make sure uh, your direction is uh, carried out. Uh, and with that, uh, Dan, I think you have one more slide. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Ken. <clears throat> one activity I wanted to flag, I think Michael touched on this earlier, but there's many examples that you'll hear about where a metropolitan planning organization being housed in a council of governments is a very positive thing. I think this is another terrific example of that. Uh, uh, approximately 2006, the Regional Transportation Council recognized the significance of the defense industry in North Texas, and we jumped into the world of defense planning. The reason this works so well is we have a lot of staff expertise in grant management. We have a lot of technical expertise that can transfer over into the defense industry. And so for the past 15 years, uh, we continue to do work. This is work that's funded through the Department of Defense. There's three key areas. Uh, this work is led now by Paul Payne and Amanda Wilson. Paul's the senior manager. Uh, Amanda does a great job on our compatible use planning. Uh, our compatible use planning is really focused on uh, making sure that our defense community can expand and grow and do what it needs to do, both at the industrial level and at the base level. Uh, folks probably don't realize Department of Defense spends over $18 billion in North Texas on an annual basis. Uh, that is a huge economic engine for North Texas when you combine this with defense, aviation, and aerospace. And so our compatible use planning really focuses on working with our defense manufacturers, our surrounding communities to make sure uh, people can grow and do what they need to do. Uh, our star, our golden uh, jewel of the region, is a Naval Air Station Joint Reserve Base Fort Worth. Uh, this was formed in the early 90s as a result of the closure of Dallas Naval Air Station and the closure of Carswell, uh, reopened NASJRB. It is a strategic military asset, not only in our region and the, uh, for the country. Uh, it is a tenant command. Over 44 different tenant commands are housed at NASJRB. Uh, it is a significant economic driver for the region. Uh, it provides a huge training uh, location for uh, our airmen and soldiers uh, from all across the country. Uh, it is growing. Uh, we're very excited the, uh, in the Air Force. The 301st will be expanding to include uh, the first reserve fleet of F-35s will be housed at NASJRB in the coming months, and so we're very uh, uh, excited about that, but we do. Staff supports a group called the Regional Coordination Committee. Sometimes we're referred to as the little MPO, but we support a group of elected officials and city staffs that uh, meet on a regular basis to make sure uh, that we're doing everything we can to preserve um, encroachment uh, from happening around the base and the base is able to do what we're able to do. And our last program, which is just starting, we're, we're really excited about another program that's going to be funded through the Department of Defense, but we actually think will be expanded into many other disciplines we're defining as our Agile Curriculum Program. Uh, that's just starting. You'll hear a lot more about that from us. But that's really a program to work with our colleges, universities, and our defense manufacturers uh, to find ways to make sure that we've got students in the pipeline uh, to feed that really valuable industry 
uh, not only to our region, but to our country. And with that, I'll turn it back to Michael to wrap us up. Dan, thank you very much. Um, we took you through a process as if you were an RTC member and you conceived an idea. Uh, we gave you those foundation elements, analytics and public outreach to get consensus on your idea. We took you through the planning process, project uh, and program delivery, the accountability and risk management that we have to do. So uh, we very much appreciate your patience in letting us present uh, your MPO in that light. You have very gifted uh, staff persons that work for you. Do not underestimate their interest to work here <clears throat> and work for you. Um, these folks could get a job probably anywhere in the country uh, doing something similar or even something different. But the fact that you give them an opportunity to uh, provide options and discuss the future of a soon-to-be 12 million person region inspires them to uh, think outside the box and uh, you you encourage us to think outside the box be a be a home for technology uh, transportation technology be a home for innovation be a home for aggressive public outreach next generation analytics uh, we very much appreciate your uh, um, partnership and interest uh, to do that. Um, thank you for your service. Um, I'm over 40 years in public service. Uh, thank you for your service in, in, uh, in public service. Um, so again, thank you very, very much for your attendance.